Hey guys, welcome back to the another episode of Be Remote Podcast. For today's episode, we have with us Liam Martin. Liam is a co-founder of Time Doctor and Stuff dot dot com. He is author of Running Remote as well. Ah, uh, thank you so much, Liam, for doing this. I'm super excited to have you on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to get into it as well. So let's start with your book. Like, uh, tell us about your book and why did you write a book on remote work? Like, there are lots of topic in the world. Like, why you chose to write a book on remote work? Yeah, there are uh, dozens of books on remote work. I'm actually holding up uh, about five or six that I have, mm-hmm. which is yeah. to me in the last couple of months. And one of the thing that I recognized when I looked at all of these books is, and there's 27 actually that are coming out in the next six months mm-hmm. cool. through um, through legitimate publishers. So there's a lot of information that's going to be coming up. Damn. Mm-hmm. The one thing that they all have in common was they would talk about how to do remote work from a technical aspect. So should you be using Slack or should you be using Microsoft Teams? Should you okay. be using Google Meet or should you be using Zoom? Mm-hmm. And what I've discovered is none of that matters at all. If those are the questions that you're trying to ask, then you don't even know what your problem is. And the fundamental issue is that remote work requires a completely different management philosophy from its on-premise office counterparts. So the vast majority of the companies are using all of these tools, but they're simply just recreating the office. And if you're stuck in Zoom nine hours a day, um, mm-hmm. honestly, you might as well kill yourself. <laughs> that is <laughs> that is just as bad as being yeah. inside of a cubicle all day, every day, yeah. five days a week for the rest of your life. There's a different way to be able to manage remote teams to be able to optimize their productivity, and that's specifically what we studied inside of running remote. Awesome. So, what is that uh, specific thing like? Uh, because a lot of people, I think, they will be on a Zoom call if they are working, right? Like that's what people do, basically. Like, uh, so what is that hack which you have uh, where we don't have to be on the Zoom call all the time and? So I studied a few dozen uh, remote first organizations that are all incredibly successful companies mm-hmm. like WordPress and Shopify and um, even some of the newer additions like Google and Facebook. And a lot of these companies that were succeeding had one single thing in common, which was okay. what we call asynchronous management. Okay. So there's two general methodologies towards remote work or just work in general. There's synchronous communication and management, and then there's asynchronous communication okay. management. Mm-hmm. And when you look at an on-premise organization, which is what we call in-office environments, everyone pays a cost. There's a sunk cost fallacy into synchronous communication because everyone gets in their cars or jumps on the train and comes to one particular place and they spend that 90 minutes of their workday coming to one particular place at one particular moment. And then they say to themselves, well, there's a buffet of collaboration and synchronous communication that they should implement. They should be collaborating as much as humanly possible. If you open up any MBA book, there's probably a lot in there saying collaboration is good. What we've discovered counterintuitively is that collaboration actually has a exponential um, drop in efficiency the more that you do it. So remote first companies have recognized that collaboration can be implemented with an a la carte method. So what's the minimum viable dose in order for everyone to achieve what my friend Cal Newport calls deep work, which is the ability Mm -hmm. for an individual to have everything at their disposal in order to solve a really complex problem. And if you have that methodology in place, then you can actually build companies much faster and much more efficiently than an in-office model. Sure, great. But at the same time, collaboration is important, right? So how do we like uh, uh, manage all this? How how can we have uh, asynchronous management in our team? So I think that synchronous, asynchronous collaboration is important, and we actually do it in a very different way that probably a lot of people listening right now, it would appear quite alien to them if they okay. came into some of our companies. Mm-hmm. So we have something called silent meetings as an example. I'm going to have one tomorrow. Silent meetings. 
Silent meetings, yes. So okay. we have a project management system. We mm -hmm. use Asana. You can use anything that you want. Okay. Um, but we have that as our platform, right? I talk in the book about how platforms are basically mm -hmm. the new office, right? So Asana is effectively our office and that's our boardroom. And we sit down and we say to ourselves, well, what are the main issues that we need to address in this meeting? Right. And we put it up on Asana. Then we debate it. And you can see 20, 30, 40 comments on a particular mm -hmm. issue, we debate that issue asynchronously, meaning we choose when to actually read that information when it's most advantageous to us and will reduce our productivity in as little a way as humanly possible. And if we actually come to a conclusion on that particular issue, then what we do is we take the conclusion, we put it to the top of the ticket, and we get rid of that issue on that meeting. And if there are less than three issues mm -hmm. that can't be concluded asynchronously, we don't have the meeting. Okay. So we don't go into a synchronous meeting. We don't actually jump onto a Zoom call. Mm -hmm. And on average, we probably have a meeting once every month, maybe one, once every month or two. I probably communicate synchronously with the company about three hours a week on average. And the other time that I spend, the other, you know, mm -hmm. basically 37 hours of my work day, I spend focusing on deep work. Right. So this is like a legit silence meeting. Like you guys don't talk only. Yeah, it's have... all through Asana. So it's all through asynchronous communication and collaboration. There's very little synchronous communication. So... Only when we have a blocker mm -hmm. inside of our asynchronous form of communication, do we move it to a synchronous form of communication? Yeah. So is there like, do you guys, like, do you give a time, a specific time? Yeah. At time, this time we'll having, we'll be having a silent meeting. So everyone is responding and all, or like it depends on person to person and all. How does this exactly No, work? because then that reinforces synchronous communications. So if everyone actually has to show up at a particular time to answer questions, mm -hmm. then they're just as distracted because then they can't actually focus on what's really important to them. What we tell everyone is, let's say you're having the meeting on Friday. Mm -hmm. All of your new issues need to be in by, you know, three days before that meeting actually is, is set to go. And then once you've done once we've debated all these things, again, if we end up with three issues, more than three issues that we can't solve asynchronously, only then do we actually have a synchronous meeting in which we all meet at the same time and discuss those issues. Okay. So you have mentioned something about introverts, right? Like uh, introvert climb on the top faster in remote first companies, like because of their thoughtfulness is seen as an asset, not a liability. So why do you think uh, this matters? Like, uh, I, I don't see any you know, angle to it. Like, uh, does it really matter being an introvert and extrovert uh, when it comes to working remotely? I don't know if you've ever been in um, some boardrooms where people are making business decisions, mm -hmm. but there seems to be a very interesting bias that occurs. Okay. The, um, the coolest person, the most charismatic person, the, mm -hmm. you know, um, in here in Canada, the, the person that looks like Captain America, the six mm -hmm. foot five, you know, white male is usually the person that ends up having most of his ideas adopted. Right. And inside of asynchronous organizations, those ideas are generally, the char most charismatic person generally does not have the best ideas. Mm -hmm. um, this is inevitable. This is just the reality of, of the situation. And usually yeah. the person who is the most thoughtful, the most intelligent is the person who has the best ideas. But unfortunately, because those people may not be trained in charismatically getting everyone over to their perspective, that rapper that they have is all that they see. You only see the wrapper. You don't actually see the candy bar, the yeah, actual yeah. Mm -hmm. thing that needs to be done. So inside of asynchronous organizations where you're reducing everything effectively to text, it's a lot easier to have good ideas translated and proliferated inside of asynchronous organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and this basically removes a lot of bias inside of these companies and they grow faster due to less stupid ideas getting moved forward simply because someone is charismatic.
Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Now, take it in consideration myself. I'm slightly on the extroverted scale yeah. of the spectrum, mm -hmm. but in comparison to your stereotypical corporate America, um, you know, person executive, I'm nowhere near uh, as convincing as some of those people. Mm -hmm. They're very, very good at convincing people of their ideas. <clears throat> yeah. But what I've recognized is that organizations that pursue that type of mindset will not be able to compete with asynchronous organizations where more of those right ideas, the more intelligent ideas are actually being adopted. And this is the big crux that I don't think a lot of people really recognize. We're not really talking about uh, asynchronous can be done in an office or outside of an office. It's just the methodology that you implement can actually provide long-term a much faster kind of direction and growth architecture inside of, um, inside of the, the, the capitalistic market that we have. Because mm -hmm. if you adopt more better ideas faster, you're going to be more successful in your organization. Okay, great. So, you know, like uh, you must have worked with a lot of remote companies and like, you know, a lot, like you have closely worked with a lot of remote leaders and all, uh, especially those who are doing the asynchronous communications, right? So like, what are some interesting facts, like, uh, especially like, you know, on the level of productivity and growth while adopting the asynchronous uh, mindset, like, uh, what are the some in interesting facts that you have observed and in terms of growth like uh, suppose the company is uh, asynchronous and uh, they, they are having asynchronous communication what is their growth and uh, another there's this another company which is like synchronous so what is the difference between those two companies and like in terms of growth and uh, productivity of the employees and yeah so it's very difficult for me to be able to provide you any type of statistically significant mm -hmm. feedback on that because the the world of asynchronous companies was a very small cottage industry before the pandemic but when right. you actually look at remote work remote work before the pandemic i would probably say 50 percent of those companies were asynchronous as a structure and post pandemic we went from four percent of the u.s workforce working remotely pre-pandemic mm -hmm. to a month after the pandemic hit 45% of the US workforce working remotely. Yeah. And I know that it's effectively happened the same everywhere else on planet earth. So we have yeah. billions and billions of people working remotely. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say probably less than 1% of companies are currently using asynchronous management in order to be able to manage the remote organizations. So with that said, <laughs> um, the companies that I reviewed are some of the fastest growing companies in the world. Uh, case in point, one is uh, Coinbase, which is yeah. mm -hmm. a company that is a cryptocurrency wallet. Yeah. And they debuted, they IPO'd last year, and they IPO'd at a $141 billion valuation. And they ended up IPOing at number 89 on the S&P 500. So the 500 most powerful companies in the United States and probably effectively the world. They're number 89. That's their debut on the stock market. And for the first time in the history of the SEC, the Security and Exchanges Commission, they were able to state that their headquarters is nowhere because they said anything else would be a lie. And yeah, yeah. this is really the future of what I see fast growing companies being is stripping away all of the BS that is connected to building these organizations and really focusing on people solving hard problems. That's effectively what companies do, right? How can you solve hard problems faster than your counterparts, than your competitors? And asynchronous management provides the ability for, again, people to be able to optimize themselves towards deep work. If you can have more of your workforce optimized towards deep work, you are going to have faster growing organizations. It is simply an inevitability. Right. Uh, at the same time, like, uh, you know, like uh, doing deep work and have like uh, managing everything asynchronously, like, uh, don't you think like employees need to have kind of training because it's new for a lot of people, as you said, like, you know, only less than 1% of the companies uh, who, who are, you know, following the asynchronous uh, management. So how do we like, uh, 
how will companies will start adopting to this and do 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 you think like company uh, companies in future like a lot of companies are going to adapt adapt to asynchronous management in future and if they mm. do how it will happen like you know i think there's a special training is required like as you said deep work a lot of people can't do deep work like they want to be surrounded by people like this kind of challenges are there right so how do we solve this kind of challenges as well first day this manager should buy the book running remote because uh, pre-order the book running remote because that's going to allow you to lay out the general architecture mm -hmm. um, there's not really anything written on this subject which i think is really interesting and um and quite scary actually because yeah. this was how remote first companies like we've figured this out over decades mm -hmm. and when remote work was adopted by everyone on planet earth they kind of just didn't really pay attention to what we've been doing for the past couple of decades. And they just said, oh, well, we're going to just recreate the office. Mm -hmm. Bad move. Um, it's definitely been a lot of unhappy workers long term. Methodology of implementing asynchronous work. One of the things that we touch out in the book is that the platform is the manager. So another thing that we found in analyzing all of these remote first patients, we discovered that they had a managerial level of the percent thinner than their in-office synchronous counterparts, mm -hmm. meaning you need less managerial overhead to actually run an asynchronous organization, which again, makes you a lot more efficient. You have more workers doing work than workers who are managing other people that are doing work. And so inside of that, that's a big factor to take into consideration. But when you have someone that starts in an asynchronous organization, the first thing that they'll usually get is the company wiki. So we have an internal wiki as an example, a really mm -hmm. great one to go check out that's open source right now is about.gitlab.com slash handbook. Okay. It has the largest open sourced process document, I believe on planet earth. There's about 8,000 oh. different um, processes that are inside of GitLab and everything inside of GitLab is actually public. It's open source. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know how to do a demo at GitLab, it's documented inside of their wiki, inside of their processes. Yeah. So we have this internal process document. We give that to our employee and we say, your job is to accomplish X. We're clearly identifying what your goals are and what your metrics are. Every employee inside of the company has longitudinal quantitative metrics. So we don't have any metrics that are ill-defined. Um, and that's another thing that we're, we saw in corporate America that was quite confusing to us was a lot of the times you would just say, well, you know, I really like John. I think that John's a really good worker, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Well, what did John actually do? Um, was John just being charismatic and the office clown? And that's why everyone likes John. And that's why John is going to keep his job. Mm -hmm. Or is John is John actually adding to the organization? And if he is, what quantitative, how much is he adding to the organization? What okay. numbers can you show me that are convinced that are going to convince me that he's basically got a positive return on investment? So that's mm -hmm. the second thing that we do. So we have these processes and we have quantitative metrics. And then from that point, you're really left to your own devices to be able to look inside of our project management system, our wiki and our metrics based documentation to accomplish what you want to accomplish inside of the organization. It requires a significant amount of autonomy. And this is something that we have uh, also found a lot inside of these remote first organizations. Mm -hmm. Autonomy is absolutely critical, yeah. but autonomy is also the number one thing that makes people happy in their job is okay. the ability to be able to accomplish their goals the way that they want to accomplish them. And mm -hmm. so if you are basically an organizer, an, an individual who says, I don't want my manager to tell me everything that I want to do. Yeah. I just want to actually get things done my own way. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask for help when I need it. An asynchronous organization is the perfect fit for you. Right. So you also mentioned about remote teams or, you know, op operate on autonomy, basically. Like uh, if, if, you're, if everything is automated, then you will have more freedom, like employees and the managers and the founders of the company as well. So how does it exactly work? And how do we automate everything? First of all, I think that is also important. Right? 
Mm, so I, I have a, an internal saying on this, which I use, I stole it from Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon mm -hmm. said, orders shouldn't be easy to understand. They should be impossible to misunderstand. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like a very small shift in your thinking, but when you actually implement this to an organization, it completely changes the way that that organization functions. So you could write a document out about how to publish a blog, uh, publish a podcast as an example. Yeah. But then, uh, and we actually have a section in the book mm -hmm. where I go through and I process document how to pour a cup of coffee. And I go to an insane level of detail on pouring a cup of coffee. Where do we source the coffee from? What kind mm -hmm. of kettle do you need? Uh, you know, how long should you leave it to steep? What machinery do you need and actually it, it, to be able to steep the coffee? And when you actually build all of this documentation and then it is adoptable by everyone inside of the organization and it's also reinforced inside of the organization, it's going to move your company much faster in the long term than if you actually directly explain it to someone in the short term. This is the core piece about asynchronous and synchronous communication and management mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't really understand. Getting the answer right now from someone else synchronously may seem like it's speeding you up in the short term, but actually building the processes for everyone to find their own answers to their own problems actually massively speeds up the organization in the long term because you can add people very quickly. People mm -hmm. aren't necessarily confused. We have team members in 43 different countries all over the world. It is almost impossible for managers to be able to manage those individual team members there. on the same time zone. You know, uh, there, as an example, all of our team members in Asia, as an uh, as a perfect mm -hmm. example, I might have one to two hours of overlap where I'm in the same time zone and working at the same time. So yeah. it really is important to be able to implement this. And once you have it, um, you can scale your organization as fast as you want. So uh, as a company, how, like uh, any example which happened with you guys, like uh, uh, how does it really helps? Can you like give a, uh, yeah, can you give a real life example, which happened, uh, you know, happened in your company? How does it really help basically? Sure. So, um, well, I'll give you an example for, for reaching out for this podcast. Mm -hmm. I'm just looking in my wiki right now. There's about 17 different processes for how to reach out to podcasts. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Vaishali was the person that ended up reaching out to you. Yeah. Yeah. And we have email copy. We're optimizing that email copy. We're doing split tests on it. We mm -hmm. have the, the scheduling link. Um, and we have a bunch of other processes that are kind of connected to this. When I had this meeting, I was able to look about five minutes beforehand. I had what you do, the website that you've come from, the background yeah. on you. Mm -hmm. And within five minutes, I was up and running and I'm going to do seven more podcasts today. Oh. And I didn't miss, yeah. I can be hyper productive mm -hmm. because I have someone else that's doing the other part of the job. And then right. I'm just focusing on the job that I need to do. Whereas right, if I was right. doing this task on my own, mm -hmm. maybe I'd get one podcast a day, yeah. but I can now do seven podcasts a day. It's very true. Yeah. This and actually, mm -hmm. if I could do 24 podcasts a day, I would try to do it. <laughs> uh, but that's physically impossible because yeah. I just don't have the energy to actually, uh, you know, I would, I would probably uh, die within two days. Yeah. Uh, and I'd yeah. probably be spouting off insanity um, <laughs> around the 30 hour mark. But, you know, if I wanted to, um, if Vaishali thought that she could actually apply another worker to this process, mm -hmm. she could do it because she has the autonomy to be able to do that. Her goal is to hit certain metrics for the launching of this book, which is I need to get on 500 podcasts before August 16th. This is, that's when the book launches. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, you can pre-order the book at this point. It's not that big of a deal, but August 16th is when the book launches. So I need yeah. to have 500 podcasts in the can mm -hmm. by that date. That's her right. goal. And then she's working towards that and we're working together, but she has complete autonomy as to how we actually achieve that particular goal. 
Right, right. Makes and sense. here's the other thing. Mm-hmm. I think the last time I spoke to Vaishali synchronously over a Zoom call was about four months ago. Damn, that's huge. But we work together every <laughs> yeah. single day. Yeah, that's amazing. This is a real life example because yeah, I've seen it. That like she reached out to me and all this happened. We uh, set set up this call and all. Yeah, makes sense. Mm-hmm. This is amazing. Yeah. Can you just give me a minute? I have to. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. Uh, yeah <clears throat> so what are the major advantages and dis- disadvantages of asynchronous management uh, as for you biggest advantage is i think we've already addressed the so i i, I think i lost you very easily be more cost efficient oh can you hear me now yeah i, I can hear you now yeah okay i'll just run the question over again <clears throat> so the biggest advantages are some that we've already stated before, which is the ability to scale your organization much faster than an on-premise organization, the ability to actually hire people much faster if you don't have to actually put them in an office. Um, It's much easier to be able to build out your organization that way. And also having the world stage as your environment to hire is much easier than just having San Francisco or New York or Toronto or London to be able to hire out people. Some of the disadvantages are the disconnect between individuals. So it really is dependent upon those processes in order to be able to run an organization. Effectively, as I said, the platform is the manager. So if your platform is no good, uh, you're not going to have a really refined organization. So you need Mm -hmm. to be able to make sure that you have a fantastic platform in place that people can communicate on asynchronously and can share information back and forth. Uh, The other part of it is disconnection from individuals. So a lot of asynchronous organizations, people can get onboarded very quickly inside of those organizations, but then they can also offboard themselves very quickly. They don't necessarily have as many ties to a company as you would if you go into an office every single day. A lot of Mm -hmm. people will um, not quit a job, not because they don't like the job. A lot of people don't really enjoy their jobs all that much at all. I think it's something like 80% of people don't like their jobs, but they Hmm. like the people in those companies. So they'll stay there because they've got their office best friend, Suzanne, and they're going to continue to work there because Suzanne's her friend and uh, you know they don't want to leave because they have a social network there. Right. We don't have as many of those types of ties, um, but actually that's not necessarily a disadvantage for us. Uh, we personally believe that if people aren't happy with the work that they're doing inside of an asynchronous organization, they shouldn't do it any longer. They should go find another job and really give that job to someone who's a lot more passionate about it. This is the great thing about having remote work is Mm -hmm. planet earth is your hiring pool. So you can find people that are very, very good at a very unique type of thing. And if they're not happy with that work, we'll find them a job somewhere else. We'll move them to another position or we'll actually move them to another company. We'll help them transition there because for us, there's no sacred knowledge inside of the organization. It's not mm. necessarily um, inside of asynchronous organizations. The workers are the operators of the company. They're not critical parts of the business that if they left, the entire business would fall apart. At least that's what it's supposed to be by design. Yeah. So uh, one one more thing which you have mentioned, right? Like remote first company have on average half as many, uh, uh, you know, uh, as managers as uh, single uh, like non remote companies. So yes. how does that help? Uh, like uh, means like is it a good thing like having less managers or like uh, um, how what what are your thoughts on it exactly? Well, from uh, 
from the shareholders perspective, it's great having less managers. Uh, yeah. The more people that you can have doing work, mm -hmm. solving difficult problems, and the less people you can have managing those people that are solving difficult problems, yeah. the faster your organization will operate and the more cost efficient your organization yeah. is. This yeah. is quite literally a horse and buggy versus Model T moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you know about the history of the Model T, but the first Model T rolled off the production line in 1915. Okay. That also happened to be the time in which there was the highest population of horses on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. So do you want to be in the, you know, the buggy business in 1915? Probably everyone would have thought, oh, these crazy Model Ts, they're not going to catch on. This is, this is incredibly stupid. 20 years later, uh, the market was completely dominated by cars. It was something yeah. like 90% of the industry mm -hmm. was using cars as opposed to horses, because it's not just an issue of, oh, a car is 10% better. Um, we're talking about exponential shifts forward in work. And when you think about that managerial layer being reduced, effectively, you would like to have no managerial layer inside of an organization. If you can remove that part of work, Mm -hmm. then you can actually make your company way more efficient and more cost effective than your competitors. And you can invest that money into things that will grow the business as opposed to simply keep the business running. So can we do this? Is it possible like uh, building a company like without managers, without having managers or like operating it? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of examples that we just, just mentioned here. Vaishali, mm -hmm. I mean, I technically manage Vaishali, but the last time that I spoke to her was four months ago. Right, right. Uh, you know, am I her manager? I don't know. I might call it something different. We might even need to mm -hmm. redefine the term. Right, um, right. I'll give you an example of someone else who's in the book. Amir, who is the founder of Todoist, which is a task management app that has tens mm -hmm. of millions of users all over the world, an incredibly popular application. He had an engineer on his engineering team that worked for him for almost five years. Okay. And he never met this person in person. He never did a video call with him and he never did an audio call with him. He only communicated with this person through project management systems, email, Damn and through instant messaging. That's crazy. This person was a fantastic engineer, mm -hmm. one of the top engineers in his company, built a incredibly successful application that's used by millions and millions of people. And yet they never actually communicated synchronously. It is possible if and... you give your people the autonomy to be able to actually solve their own problems, they're going to not only grow your business faster, but your employees are going to be a lot happier because of it. Right, right. So, uh, you know, like uh, building this kind of system, system in our organization is like really difficult. So how do you as a leader manage and lead a asynchronous company? Or if someone wants to start an asynchronous company, how should you go ahead and, you know, what kind of process they should uh, go for? Sure. So um, you said manage and lead, and that's actually a core premise that I, I want to kind of bring up. Uh, you shouldn't manage, you should lead. So forget about management. Okay. The platform is managing everything. What you need to focus on is leadership. So when I have mm -hmm. one-on-ones with some of my direct reports, I don't ask them about their metrics because I already see their metrics. They're already documented. It's very right. clear. They mm -hmm. know whether they're hitting them or not. And we've discussed asynchronously why they're not hitting or are hitting those particular targets. Mm -hmm. What I want to talk ab about instead is um, we ha I had a team member whose dog died a few weeks ago mm -hmm. and her children are heartbroken over this and trying to figure out how to help her children through this difficult time and obviously the rest of her family. Mm -hmm. That is leadership, focusing on the direction that we're going to go as a company and why you're here and why you should be excited to actually work in mm -hmm. this company. That's leadership. Uh, making decisions as an example to uh, get your team out of Ukraine before war breaks out. That's mm -hmm. leadership. That's not necessarily management. And that's mm -hmm. what people should really be focusing on. Uh, not necessarily whether they achieve their goals. These games of telephone where I tell you what my numbers are. You tell your manager what my numbers are. Mm -hmm. And then that person tells the boss what my numbers were. Why can't we just cut all of those people out and have the boss directly look at my numbers? Right. 
amazing that makes sense so uh, let's do this like tactically if you want to transition and a synchronous com- a company to a synchronous com- a company or if uh, some is if, if i'm starting a, a synchronous organization a synchronous organization suppose so what should uh, we do uh, like in the first three months uh, as a company like to build platforms and like what are the right step to go ahead and build this so first thing is uh, you're right start to develop the platform as the manager <clears throat> so the first thing that i would do is figure out what are the biggest things throughout your work day that if you weren't in the company, no one would know how to do them. This is what I call sacred knowledge inside of the organization. Take that sacred knowledge and document it. Write it down, create a video, create a screen capture, Mm -hmm. get that information out of your head and into some type of format that can be digitized and shared with everyone inside of the organization. Mm -hmm. We have this mindset, which is, Everyone inside of the company should have the same informational advantage as the CEO of the corporation. Once you have that and you have all of that information at your disposal, then you can actually move towards the communication side, which is really making sure that everyone knows exactly what they need to be doing. So they're they're clear on what they're going to do tomorrow, next week, next month, and they don't need a manager to tell them what's going to happen tomorrow next week Mm -hmm. or next month and then very clearly documenting that information and communicating it back to effectively the mothership right i talk i I talk a lot about this it's like uh someone in another podcast kind of told me that uh, i don't know if you've ever seen star trek before the uh the television show yeah yeah i've seen the television series so there's a there's a, a organization in star trek called the borg which mm-hmm. is like these cybernetic organisms that are all connected to each other yeah. and they're just simply connected to the platform think about asynchronous work somewhat like the borg but maybe the friendly mm-hmm. version where mm-hmm. any single individual can be removed from the collective and the collective will still function and operate without any problem whatsoever because Mm -hmm. it's everyone's collective knowledge that's actually solving problems it's not necessarily the individual that has some type of sacred knowledge in that you know can hold the company effectively at gunpoint then once you've done all of those things um then it's just reinforcing that so figuring out when people ask questions try to respond with the actual answer inside of the process documentation that you have. So if you ask me, well, how should I email people to reach out for podcasts? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the process document on that. Well, how should I sign my emails? Here's the process document for that. Mm -hmm. I've been in some of these asynchronous organizations where I've asked these questions and after them very politely responding in that way about a dozen times, they've come to me and said, hey, so you're asking too many questions. Uh, Mm -hmm. You should really just spend two minutes (laughs) looking at the actual uh, Uh processes that we have inside of the organization. And if you can't figure out in five minutes, Mm -hmm. absolutely contact us, but take a little bit of time to be able to figure out the answer to your own question, as opposed to disrupting someone else's productivity by asking that question directly right right like suppose someone new uh, is coming from a synchronous organization to asynchronous organization so it can like it could be hard for people like i think a lot of uh, what people are used to is like uh, someone manager or the employees they tell us like yeah this is what you need to do and this is what you know how things works that's what's sure. been happening I mean, how with many companies people right? like managers like if we polled everyone saying do you like being managed no, no one likes that. Yeah. Probably 90% of people would say, I yeah. don't like being managed. Exactly. I would like to do my own thing. Yeah. Well, <laughs> asynchronous organizations provide you that type of opportunity mm-hmm. to be able to have your own autonomy to solve problems in your own way and not necessarily be bothered by reporting information to individuals. And again, playing this game of telephone that no one really needs to do. We're in the 21st century. We can basically collect and distribute information all over planet Earth right. synchronously as quickly as humanly possible um, in, the fra- in a fraction of a second. But we seem to not be doing that when it applies to work. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like, uh, 
yeah so when when like i think uh, having the documentation and having the like information like maybe videos or document that that, that is like one of the most important thing when it comes to uh, like running a asynchronous organization like by talking to i have like concluded one thing for sure that having a uh, right documents right information like that is like one of the most important thing if you are running a you know the uh, asynchronous organization I absolutely would, like, it's it's so it, i would probably say that step one and then go to the communication and then go to your management. So if I were going to basically tell you three things to do in the first 90 days, yeah. month one, document. Month two, communication. Month three, management in that order. Right, right. And when it comes to documentation, I think uh, some people don't like to read, like, I don't know, some people would might want to watch videos, right? So we could do like we could also create the videos and we could also write the documents as well like as per the absolutely so inside of the vast majority of our process documentation we have a text format mm -hmm. so steps that people go through yeah to be able to accomplish a particular task but then in the vast majority of cases we also have a video uh we use a tool called vidyard and another really great tool is loom that gives yeah, you yeah. a screen grab of your computer and then it will basically, you can put your webcam on, you can, um, you can even point to things, you can edit the video however you'd like, and then you turn that into a cloud-based link that is a video link, and you can put that inside of your process documentation. Yeah. So uh, tell us about your favorite remote companies, like companies in remote space. I think it's a really interesting time for remote companies. So yeah. even three months ago, I would probably would have had a different list. Um, okay. Basecamp and GitLab, which are some of the original companies yeah. that really built remote first asynchronous organizations at scale uh, are really great ones to take a look at. Another really fantastic one that's a pioneer is Buffer mm -hmm. and they run a social media app, but incredibly successful organization that's a relatively small business but has been, um, has been incredibly successful commercially. Uh, there's also other big businesses that are going remote in big ways and to a degree are actually implementing some asynchronous policies. Twitter, as an example, is a remote mm -hmm. first organization at this point. They're shutting down their offices. Shopify oh. is sh shutting down all of their offices. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook, now Meta, is saying that within the next two years, they want 50% of their workforce, entire workforce, Mm -hmm. to be remote, to not have to go inside Damn. of an office. Even Apple, right? Yeah, yeah. Apple, the biggest company in the world uh, by valuation, yeah. they <clears throat> were trying to get people to go back to the office and mm. their employees actually wrote a massive letter signed by thousands of Apple employees saying, mm. we refuse to go back to the office. So this is not an issue of... Um, the pandemic really opened up Pandora's box. Where we're at a point now and saying, everyone's had a taste of remote work. They don't want to go back. About 80% of people want to in part work remotely. That's what the vast majority of the polling is giving yeah, us. Yeah. You can't just say remote work is a nice to have anymore. It's a requirement. And if you want to actually get A players inside of your organization, they're going to demand remote yeah, work yeah. agreements. So you have to be ready to implement remote work inside of your organizations. And as I said before, 99% of them are just simply recreating the office. You need mm -hmm. to manage those people differently. Asynchronous management is the answer. Okay. Yeah. So uh, tell us about your like top three favorite books uh, in remote space. Yeah. And oh, I have part, them right, right here. <laughs> <laughs> so remote.com. Uh, Basecamp is a really great book that's going to give you a lot of base knowledge about how to run not only a remote organization, but also to a degree, an asynchronous organization. Mm -hmm. Another one that's really good, which I've been uh, going through is Remote Teams Work. That's a really good tactical document. And then this one, which has been good, is Working From Home by, um, I can't remember her name, Karen Mangia. And this one just came out recently, but really good to understand work from the employee's perspective, mm -hmm. remote work from the employee's perspective, not necessarily from the employer's perspective. And there's yeah. a ton of others, 
Um, yeah. There's so many that are coming out on the market right now. But as I said before, if you're try if you're trying to get out of a book, whether to use Slack or Microsoft Teams mm -hmm. or Zoom or Google Meet, yeah. you're asking the wrong question. You actually need to figure out how to manage mm -hmm. remote first organizations. And that's the big thing that you should be starting from. Then figure out whether or not you're going to use Slack or Microsoft yeah. Teams. Amazing. So your book is coming on 16th August, right? Your book as well. 16th of August, yes. And you can pre-order the book now. It's available on Amazon and everywhere else that books are available. Uh, if you just go to runningremote.com, mm -hmm. you'll be able to check out everything connected to the book. Uh, we have a bunch of extra kind of like cool um, uh, bonuses for anyone that pre-orders the book at this point. And then outside of that, if you just want to learn more about, you know, running remote in general, YouTube is probably the best place, youtube.com slash running remote. I yeah, yeah. put up talks there and all of our talks are free uh, mm -hmm. and available on that YouTube channel. So if you don't have the money to actually attend our conference that we do every single year, youtube.com slash running remote is the best spot. Yeah. Awesome. So we can also uh, put up a link down here of, for your book. Uh, yeah. For, for free ordering. Yeah. We can do that as well. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. So it was really amazing talking to you, LM. Like we got a completely different perspective, especially the silent meeting. I've never heard about it and a lot of things. <laughs> so yeah, it was a mind blowing talking with you. And I think uh, like our listeners will get a completely different perspective, especially on uh, like, you know, very deep. We I, I've, uh, before also I've talked about asynchronous management, but uh, this time we got, you know, really deep into it. And I think there's a still lot to it. Maybe we can talk about it again sometime. So thank you so much for doing this. It was really amazing talking to you. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate being on. Awesome.